All right, you ready for this? Ready. Hi, folks. Tom Salemi here. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We have a slightly uh, different format for you today because uh, we are neck deep in getting ready for Device Talks West, which, of course, is happening on October 19th and 20th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. I hope you will join us there. You can uh, enjoy conversations with folks from Abbott and Boston Scientific and Medtronic and Zimmer Biomet and Penumbra and Shockwave. We'll have keynote conversations with Leslie Trigg of Outset Medical, with Deb Kilpatrick of Evidation Health. We'll talk with Gary Guthart, the CEO of Intuitive, as well as Celine Martin of Johnson & Johnson. So, so much going on. We'll be talking about product development, about manufacturing medical devices, about designing better medical devices, about understanding what's happening on the healthcare scene and how that's impacting future product development. We'll talk supply chain. So much going on. Go to devicetalks.com, check out the agenda, and uh, please do join us there. It's going to be a great couple of days. Lots of high-level conversations are happening. So because we're pouring so much work into Device Talks West, I wasn't able to uh, connect with my good pal and co-host, Chris Newmarker. So today I'm going to bring you two great conversations that I had with leaders at Olympus America and ZimV. First, I'm going to speak with Swana Alcorn. She is Business Unit Vice President of Respiratory at Olympus America. And uh, we talked a great deal about uh, the, the benefits of reusable endoscopes versus single-use endoscopes, and uh, more broadly about changes that are coming in the respiratory space. So, And then a little later in the podcast, going to connect with Rebecca Whitney. She is the global spine president at ZimV, the new company that spun out of Zimmer Biomet. So we'll talk about the spin out and we'll talk about what ZimV is offering in the spine space and uh, and where the spine is headed. So two great interviews with two great folks, happy to bring them to you. And uh, in between, I'll uh, give you an update on some some other news we have at Device Talks and our sister publications, uh, Mass Device and Metal Design and Outsourcing. So without any further delay, I'd like to start my interview with Swana Alcorn. Again, she's a business unit vice president of respiratory at Olympus. Well, Swarner Alcorn, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. We're uh, we're going to hit upon uh, an exciting topic, a popular topic, single use in reusable endoscopes, and and sort of where where we're headed in in the endoscope space. But uh, before we get into that topic, I'd love to uh, find out. A bit about you. Uh, How did you find your way into the medical device industry and uh, over there at Olympus? Well, Tom, so interestingly enough, coming out of college, I really wanted to have your job. Um, I was a broadcast journalism major, Uh um, really wanted to get into media, uh, but instead found my way into medical device. Started out at a company called Drager Medical, uh, moved to Siemens, uh, and then about 16, 17 years ago, made the move to Olympus. And for the bulk of that time have have been with Olympus. I had a three-year hiatus where I left the company and then came back. At Olympus, I I started uh, as an entry-level marketing associate. And over the course of these past 16, 17 years, have had the opportunity to work through a variety of departments, uh, really learn the company inside and out, the customers, the markets, and ultimately uh, am in the position now to lead one of our business units. So very much focused on respiratory technologies in that space and, and working with clinicians to the best of our ability. And what is the business that, within Olympus that you're working with and sort of what, what products are you in charge of or selling? Yep. So it's the respiratory business unit um, for Olympus. And really there's three parts to our portfolio. There's our lung cancer solutions. So we're very much focused on 
innovating products here for the, the management and staging of lung cancer. We have uh, our spiration valve. So for the treatment of emphysema uh, and air leaks, post-operative air leaks. And then we have our single use bronchoscopes, which is a part of our hybrid bronchoscopy portfolio or platform. Um, and so this is bringing together you know, our market leading reusable bronchoscopes and then our much newer and more innovative uh, single use bronchoscopes together. Right. Yeah. And I think I said, I might've said endoscopes earlier. I should have said bronchoscopes. So shame on me. Interesting transition though, from, uh, from journalism to business. There's not a lot of uh, overlap between the two. I would think I tend to, I think folks who do what I do, I often think can't do what you do. So uh, how'd that transition happen? You just sort of uh, decided that uh, you wanted to be in the business of business? So um, I decided that I needed to have a paycheck that allowed yeah. <laughs> me to get off the parental payroll, right? And so that was that was the first yeah. impetus. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you that you know between journalism, kind of the core competencies of what you're doing, and the core competencies of what I'm doing, there's this overlap in communication, right? I mean, huh. business can't happen if you can't communicate. And so I think that is the thread that ties the two together. And so Tom, I think that you absolutely could. Uh, make the jump over here. And you know, if you need a co-host, then I can make the jump back. There we go. All right. We can we can have co-jobs. I'll I'll share your job. You can share mine and we'll uh, job sharing. We'll, we'll figure it out. Perfect. Awesome. Well let's talk about uh about what you're doing in, in the bronchoscope space and uh sort of where you are with the introduction or the sales of of single use bronchoscopes. How how widely used are, are single use and reusable, well, let's talk about single use. How widely used are single use bronchoscopes right now? Are they making a dent? So I think if you take a look at the different care settings within a hospital, the different utilities that uh, a practitioner might be looking at for a single use scope, right now, single use scopes have, have certainly made a dent into the airway management market. So if you're looking at the ICU, if you're looking at the emergency department, the chances are that you're seeing uh, in any given hospital, a fairly significant shift mm -hmm. in the usage of single use, right? When you get into more of the specialty use cases, so if we're talking about, for instance, for where we are, the pulmonary suite, we're starting to see the interest, uh, but not the full utilization yet. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But so I'd say in the, in the scope of single use endoscopy, you're seeing it more widely adopted and used in the airway management space with now... Uh, pulmonologists who oftentimes are spending 30% of their time in those critical care settings, mm -hmm. they're seeing them in use, right? And they're thinking about potential application in the bronchoscopy suite. Um, but we're still kind of, I would say, at the infancy of the usage of single use scopes in the bronchoscopy suite. So if, if I'm uh, using a, a reusable bronchoscope and I'm not interested in switching over to a single use at this time, what, what, are, what are my, what's my rationale? What are the benefits of a, of a reusable bronchoscope? Well, first of all, I mean, this is, you know, bronchoscopy, flexible bronchoscopy was really introduced about 50 years ago. And Olympus has been a, a leading device manufacturer in bronchoscopy since about that time. So if you think about how long bronchoscopy has been available as a specialty, the introduction of interventional pulmonology, these are highly skilled clinicians that have been using reusable technology um, since their days in training. And so reusable bronchoscopes still meet all of their needs. Uh, different patients present with different use cases, right? And so the clinicians that we've been working with for the past decades have been very comfortable applying our technology to these different patient presentations. So from a reusable bronchoscope perspective, there's no reason to make a full switch to single-use bronchoscopy if it is not in the economic best interest of the facility to do so. The technology is great, right? The image is outstanding. And the utility of these scopes is still, is still second to none. So I think there's and that's why we talk about when we talk about single use bronchoscopy, it's still in that kind of infancy stage because the reusable technology is so good. And so we're seeing clinicians and industry trying to work together to find out what are the right use cases for single use bronchoscopy. And those things are happening um, and they'll continue to evolve. Now, this may be one of those stupid questions I get to ask, but is there any, is it any easier to clean and disinfect and sterilize a bronchoscope as, a, as opposed to other scopes? 
you know, I think that reprocessing in general for all scopes, um, if you follow the IFUs, if you follow the directions, they're not difficult to clean. Mm -hmm. And Olympus, as the leader in reusable endoscopic technology, we put a lot of education and training behind effective reprocessing. So now pulling in a little bit of my service background, we have a very unique profile within Olympus called the endoscopy support specialist. And we have almost 100 uh, what we call ESS that are deployed throughout the country to work with clinicians on exactly this, uh, how to properly and effectively reprocess the scopes. I have to say that there's not, it's not easier or harder. They are all easy if you follow the directions um, and you access the training that manufacturers deliver. Mm, Interesting. We've talked about this on the podcast and at our conferences in the past, sort of the the environmental impact of of single use versus reusable. How is that fit into your conversations with folks? Is it is it better for the environment to sort of fit ESG goals? If you're reusing bronchoscopes, those that, that sell single use say, well, no, you actually use more materials in the sterilization and the, and the reprocessing than you, you save by using a single use. How do you view the impact on the environment when it comes to these scopes? You know, when you're introducing anything that says single use, right? This is is contributing to additional waste. Now, there are programs in place to recycle single-use scopes to the, to the best of that ability. And this is something that Olympus is also exploring. When we're talking to customers, this certainly comes up, right? It, when we're talking to customers about their aptitude or their um, appetite, I should say, for accessing single-use technology, two things that we're talking about. We're talking about um, environmental sort of impact. And we're talking about cost. And those two things can really tie into one another as well. So single use, yes, it's, it's, you're putting more plastic, Mm -hmm. right, into use. And I think, you know, even from the consumer side, we all have a, maybe a a feeling or an opinion on that, but there's application for it. And the other thing that facilities are are asking about inquiring and talking to us about um, is the impact on cost, the overall cost for the healthcare system as more and more single use scopes come into play. So we have these conversations openly, get a lot of feedback from customers as they're thinking about their environmental impact, but also uh, maybe even more so the, the impact uh, to cost. Interesting. Let's, let's shift gears a bit and talk a, a bit about navigation. Olympus had made a uh, acquisition of, of Varen and it had a, Varen had its spin system. I forget the acquisition was... Gosh, it was two or three years ago now? Probably yeah, more. 2020. Okay, great. Uh, what has uh, what has Varen brought to uh, to Olympus? And, and how is the uh, sort of the integration of the two cultures and, and the two companies or the integration of Varen into Olympus? How has that gone? Yeah. So Varen, a startup, right? Olympus, yep. a more corporate kind of a, a more mature organization. And so inherently, you've got two uh, two kinds of approaches to, to daily tasks to um, R&D, to processes. So I think when two entities come together that are, you know, sort of have this difference in how they execute like a daily routine, there's an opportunity to learn from one another, right? Try to get the best out of what the other one is bringing to the table. And so from the Varen side, we see agility, agility in their process, agility in their um, focus on innovating. Um, From the Olympus side, we see maturity in very important functions in med tech, compliance, legal, regulatory. And so bringing these things together has been a labor of love, but one that has provided to be quite beneficial to both teams. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're bringing in a relatively smaller organization into a larger organization, in our case, what we were doing is bringing together two sales teams that effectively had to learn whole new product portfolio. So Combined, you know, we talked about at the top what what Olympus Respiratory is, and it's really the lung cancer solutions portfolio for us, which is EBIS scopes, needles, core devices, and from Varen, the spin thoracic navigation system. So we're bringing that to bear, mm-hmm. um, we're bringing those valves into play, the spiration valves, and then our single use bronchoscopes and our reusable bronchoscopes. So what I think uh, we've really observed is the amount of time that you have to spend on effectively training both sales teams that are now coming together into one on the full portfolio. And Olympus as a sort of a leading player in the respiratory suite, 
we often have the privilege of being invited in by a physician to support a case. For me and for my team, the most important thing is that when one of our sales reps goes into the bronchoscopy suite and has that privilege, that they're able to consult effectively. One thing that I think has been really good is that we've broadened you know, the depth and breadth of what we are providing into the bronchoscopy suite, and we can consult more effectively. So for us, because we've got this you know, fuller portfolio, if one of our reps is in the room uh, to support a valve case, and let's say there's an issue with the, with the tower that the scope's running off of, they can consult on that. If we have a doctor who's really comfortable with reusable technology and is inquisitive about single use offerings, we can consult on that. You know, so in these different ways, we're able to answer more questions, but it took time. It took a lot of time to effectively train this sort of combined sales organization to do that. Interesting. Yeah. And I remember the, the Spiration acquisition. That was obviously a much longer time ago when there, yes. were, there was a whole sea of, of valves out there, companies creating pulmonary valves. And Spiration is definitely is one that uh, withstood the test of time. What has the uh, opportunity or the, the availability of Spin Thoracic's uh, navigation system brought in by the Varan acquisition? What has that done for your sales team and for your portfolio? What does it allow you to sort of provide to your, your surgeon customers? It's really uh, allowed us to build out our lung cancer solutions portfolio. So this is you know one of our core focuses as we move forward. If you look at our plans for technology, uh, the ways that we want to partner with with our physicians, it's really in helping to more effectively uh, diagnose and stage lung cancer, which happens to be one of the deadliest cancers and probably one of the most not talked about cancers, especially when it comes to screening. So right now, less than 10% of those who are eligible or should be screened are getting screened. And that means that lung cancer nodules that are sort of out there in the periphery of the lung, and that is more typically stage one cancers that are easily treatable, we're not finding those until they really present with symptoms that are causing a patient to go in for an evaluation. Hmm. And by that point, right, you're at a stage three, potentially a stage four. Our goal and why it was so important to uh, acquire Varen and bring these technologies together, our goal is to help healthcare providers more easily diagnose and stage those cancers in the periphery of the lung. And acquiring the spin navigation system was sort of step one in that. And, and a lot of exciting technology to come as a result of the acquisition. That is really it. It is helping healthcare practitioners make a bigger dent in this very, very deadly disease called lung cancer. Hmm. I was going to ask about step two. I mean, do you, do you have some technologies coming down the road that are going to amplify your ability to diagnose these cancers earlier? We do. Um, and, you know, I can... I can only talk so much about that at this point, but I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you that, you know, as a whole, if you think about where the unmet clinical need is, it's real time sampling the periphery, right? And so that is where we're, I think industry, industry as a whole, mature companies, startup companies, we're all focused here because we know that if we can effectively get there, if we can effectively sample in real time, then we can help to catch more stage one cancer. And that is ultimately why we're all doing this, right? Is to is to help um, and to save more lives. So that that is the future, I think, for the industry as a whole. And we're seeing some companies, uh, including uh, Intuitive, uh, rolling out products that are that are able to use surgical systems to get into the lung for for the purpose of diagnosis or treatment. How does that change the space? And is that something that Olympus needs to respond to in kind with something? Yeah, I mean, right now we're seeing uh, customers effectively using SPIN, uh, effectively uh, incorporating robotics. And what it does for us is it means that there's more attention, again, on trying to address the impact that lung cancer has. As more players come into this, as more R&D dollars are spent, or more technology comes in, uh, ultimately the winner here is the patient, right? And so I think in terms of Olympus responding, we are always looking for ways to innovate, right? Olympus is an R&D engineering company with deep, deep roots in bringing the very best innovative technologies to market. And so we're always innovating. Um, we are watching carefully what's happening in terms of trends within bronchoscopy and are planning um, responses to that, not just from a competitive standpoint, but again, from a patient-centered approach to figure out how can we assist in and staging and diagnosing more stage one cancer. 
Right. And final question. I've organized meetings in the past to sort of look at med tech innovation in the respiratory space. It was surprisingly, it wasn't as deep as I thought it would be. It seems like pulmonary and respiratory hasn't received a lot of attention. It's received some, but not as much attention from the medical device entrepreneurs and investors that I thought it might. Do you see that changing? Does that need to change? Olympus is there with its R&D providing its innovation, but as you noted with Barron's acquisition, you know you can you can find some great ideas outside as well. Over the next couple of years, how do you see the appetite for innovation in the respiratory space changing both within Olympus and, and outside of Olympus? So I'll tell you that um, if you if you go back a number of years, I agree with you that pulmonary bronchoscopy was not always uh, the specialty or practice line that was getting you know, enormous amounts of attention, uh, both, you know, internally from hospitals, externally from industry. And I absolutely have seen a shift and shift in thinking, a shift in focus for Olympus specifically, you know, a couple of years back, our president, our global uh, CEO and president, Yaz Takeuchi, um, made it very clear that Olympus was very much focused on respiratory. And it's one of our four focused businesses, meaning This is a business within Olympus that will be receiving a lot of investment, a lot of R&D focus, a lot of collaboration with healthcare practitioners. So for Olympus, respiratory is absolutely a focus. And I can see that in the plans that we have for future technology, um, in the ways that we're looking at both organic and inorganic activity, in the level of conversations that we're having with key opinion leaders in the field. And from them, I can also feel that Uh, hospitals are recognizing the importance of pulmonary as a specialty within their healthcare system and providing more and more funding uh, for more and more innovation to happen. And and Tom, I really think this goes back to the point that I, I guess I'm sort of harping on now, which is just how deadly of a cancer lung cancer is. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of reasons, I think you think about screening, this attention for screening that breast cancer has gotten, colorectal cancer has gotten, and we don't see that same level, right, for lung cancer. And sometimes I wonder if, if folks like an average person thinks about the behaviors that they've done that may have impacted their propensity to get lung cancer and so sort of shy away from getting screened, uh, the education that needs to happen for more screening. So I think that as we're all thinking about how to enable a larger part of the patient population to get screened, healthcare systems, IDNs, industry, med tech, pharma, you're seeing all of us sort of rally around this specialty in particular. And so I do absolutely think that over the next few years, you will see a lot of technological innovation here. I agree. And I mean, just climate change and and, and air quality changes, I mean, that's only going to increase the the prevalence of, of lung cancer, I'm afraid. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, very, very fascinating stuff, uh, Sworn Alcorn. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Tom, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed that conversation with Swarna Alcorn. As I mentioned at the top, I wanted to mention that our medical design and outsourcing magazine will be putting out its women in med tech issue. Uh, it should come out in about a week and a half, around the same the same week of uh, Device Talks West, and uh, it's a it's an annual effort led by senior editor Danielle Kirsch and of course managing editor Jim Hammerand, and it's going to be a uh, jam packed issue filled with uh, articles that highlight the profile medical device leaders who are women and uh, the positions that they hold and some other uh, more analytical pieces uh, that look at things like representation in the senior executive levels by women. So it is a great issue. It's a great effort by Danielle and Jim. It'll feature uh, profiles, including uh, one with Kate Rosenbluth. She's the founder and chief scientific officer at Kayla Health. So she'll also be on our panel, one of our panels at Device Talks West. She's actually going to be uh, one of three panelists on our keynote panel at the end of day two. She's going to be speaking about uh, basically how new technologies are impacting product development. And uh, Kate will speak to Kayla Health's effort. Kayla, of course, is a very cool bioelectronic company. So happy to have her on that panel. And uh, again, happy to have as our keynotes, Leslie Trigg, Celine Martin, Deb Kilpatrick, and many more fantastic medtech leaders who are women 
uh, will be on stage at Device Talks West. So I do hope you will check out that issue of Medical Design and Outsourcing. A lot of those profiles and articles are already up on medicaldesignandoutsourcing.com, so you can find them there. And of course, I hope you'll join us at Device Talks West to uh, sit in on those conversations and keynotes that I've already mentioned. Now, I think it's a good time to start my interview with Rebecca Whitney. She is Global Spine President at ZimV. Well, Rebecca Whitney, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me. I'm excited to learn about uh, one of the major new med tech players, Zimvi. But first, I wanted to understand a bit about your background. You've uh, made a career out, out of med tech. I'd love to know how you, uh, how you found your way into this industry and sort of what drew you here. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was getting my master's in business and I actually went straight into my MBA from my undergrad degree. And I fell into an internship, frankly, that was in the med tech space. It was with Beckton Dickinson, BD Medical. And the internship was fantastic. Yeah. And, and really kind of exposed me to the industry. And it was love at first sight. I, I enjoyed it so much that I ended up accepting a job straight out of MBA school with BD Medical without really kind of doing a full search or anything else. It just Loved every second of it. So kind of fell into it a bit serendipitously, but it's been a great path and have zero regrets. I've just loved the space. Did you have a, a path in mind with getting your MBA? I imagine you must have had some plan in place. I did. I actually believed I was going into finance. I spent <laughs> a little bit of time at Merrill Lynch. Yeah, exactly. And I'm a pretty data-driven person and always assumed that finance was the path for me, which is why I went to grad school. But I realized in grad school that taking more of a marketing commercial business path would allow me to actually incorporate some of those finance skills and analytical skills to make me more effective in the, the commercial world. So I took a bit of a course correction halfway through my, my MBA, but yeah, finance was the path I was headed down in, in, until that internship. Interesting. So what you had, you had a, a bachelor's in organizational communication at the University of Utah. You got your MBA. What doors did that open in the med tech industry? What are those skills best applied? So I took a bit of a different path. I was done with my undergrad at a pretty early age. I was 20 just because of, of timing and AP credits and the like. And frankly, was not ready to enter the workforce because I was 20. And so I went <laughs> straight into grad school. And so, yeah, I like to say my life and my career has been kind of a series of happy accidents, believe it or not. And going straight into grad school is what exposed me to basically the med tech space through this internship. And so Going into to get my MBA was was really more theory than practical application because I was so young and I didn't have any practical work experience other than summer jobs and, and internships. And so I learned a ton. I, I think I got the better deal out of that because I was able to glean from my colleagues throughout the program, but I wasn't able to contribute in terms of real life application. So I soaked it up, learned all the theory, and then jumped right into the job and was able to apply those learnings into a practical environment at age 22 as an associate product manager at BD Medical. So it worked out, but probably not the, the recommended or preferred timing in terms of getting a master's degree. That's great. You have went from product management at BD to uh, sales and marketing at, uh, at, at another company. Did you have a sense uh, that you wanted to get on an executive track? Was it all a series of happy accidents that you didn't really plan for and it just sort of kept New stones kept appearing in front of you to, to step on, or did you sort of have in your mind where you wanted to be at this place in time, where we all are now? You know, I would say it was probably a balance of both. And I say that because I'm a very driven person. I've always been drawn to whatever's next and whatever is kind of ahead of me. But it wasn't like I set off on this path and said, hey, I aspire to run a division or a company. It was really more about making the most of, of every opportunity. And those stones did keep presenting themselves, to your point. And luckily, I was working hard and well-positioned to kind of take things as they came, which has eventually led me to where I am today. But, but yeah, it's been, I've always, I've always tried to keep a very open mind as opportunities have come my way. And that's allowed me to, to have a background that varies in terms of size of the company. I've worked at very large companies and tiny startups and kind of everything in between. And every one of those opportunities has, has either expanded my, my skill set or exposed me to new ways of thinking all of which kind of culminates in the role I have today. So very grateful for, for all of those things that have kind of come my way and being open enough to take those chances as they present themselves. That's great. And, and you had an uh, unusual, uh, I don't know if we'll call it a sabbatical from MedTech, but you were at, at Galen Partners, the investment firm. How did that uh, play into your, your, your plans? Was just, again, one of those opportunities that arose? It was actually, so Galen was our major shareholder in one of these startups that I was working for. And when ah. we sold the company to, to CR Bard, yeah. So I got to know them very well. 
as members of our board. And when we sold our company to CR Bard, they said, you know what? You should come work for us. It was actually great. I moved from Salt Lake City, Utah to Manhattan and was able to work directly for the private equity firm and get a feel for the way they manage their portfolio companies, how they look at investments. And as I mentioned earlier, I have a strong passion for financing yeah. the, the analytical world. And so for me, it was kind of a, a really nice opportunity to round out that experience. And to your point, take a sabbatical from being a part of an operating company to understand more of a strategic finance side of things, but ultimately knew I'd be back into a portfolio company, uh, helping them run one of their companies under their purview. Did you go there? You're right. It's a great perch to sort of stand on and, and be able to look at various opportunities of companies that are doing very cool things in many different industries. But it, it looks as if you moved from Galen to Covidian. So you opted to move back into a, a larger company or is there a step in there that I'm that I'm missing? No, you got it. In fact, I, I like to say my career is interesting because it basically goes small company, large, and then on and on. And so, yeah, you know, what happened is, is Covidian presented me with an opportunity that felt like it was a bit of a, a carve out within the larger Covidian world. And so it was intriguing to me because it fit the profile of a lot of the companies I've been helping Galen assess. And so basically I was part of an incubator team that was carved out from Covidian to basically run a little fast paced startup within that organization. And so when I left Galen to do that, we obviously stayed in touch. And long story short, they had acquired a company in Golden, Colorado, shortly after I moved out to take the Covidian role. And after a couple of years of, of staying in touch, they convinced me to, to join them at that portfolio company and basically round two with them as another member of the board and helping to build that up. And we eventually sold that to GE Healthcare. Wow. So what finally uh, led you to Zimmer Biomet? They reached out. It was really interesting. We sold our company to GE Healthcare and I stayed on. So I was helping manage that integration and was once again, kind of making that pivot back to large company environment, going from a small startup and then being acquired by GE, obviously another big change. But I like both environments. I think both offer pros and cons. When Zimmer Biomet reached out, it was actually Biomet and Biomet mm. had just acquired Lynx, which is a tiny little, at the time, a tiny spine startup here in Colorado. And they said, hey, look, we bought this company. We're a small, privately held, fast growing fine company. And we really need to build out the commercial and marketing capabilities. And we'd like you to, to join the team to do that. And what's funny is, as I was going through the interview process, I was just in the final stages. And that's when Zimmer announced that they were intending to acquire Biomet. <laughs> and so it did give me pause, right? Because I was leaving GE Healthcare for what I thought would be a smaller, more nimble organization. And so mm -hmm. it did give me pause. But I'm, I'm so glad I decided to, to stick to it because it allowed me to, so for the first year I was with Biomet and was doing exactly what um, they'd asked me to do, not to mention getting exposed to this massive integration planning. And then, of course, from there, the rest is history. So that was about eight years ago. And I've been with Zimmer Biomet now Zimby ever since. Interesting. So uh, I forgot, this is great. I, I kind of forgot all about links. Uh, it's like talking to someone about people you went to college with. It's like, oh, yeah, that links. I forgot about links. Um, <laughs> So was the interest in the culture primarily, or did you have an interest in spine? Because you, you seem to have really established yourself in the spine space, which is a difficult area to operate in. Yeah. So I think the fact that I've worked in such various segments of med tech, I get bored pretty easily. And I like learning new spaces and, and taking on new challenges. That's just kind of the way I'm wired. And so as they approached me with this opportunity and I started digging in and, and learning more about the spine industry, I realized that this was an industry and, and a business, frankly, that was going to continue to present opportunities to solve problems, do things differently. And, and frankly, kind of that active learning component, which is very important to me, was ripe with opportunity. And so I jumped into it. Now, you're right. I, I didn't fully appreciate until I was in the role that for the most part, spine is a fairly incestuous group and it's it's not necessarily typical to kind of break in. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of didn't know what I didn't know. So right. I, I jumped in, I learned it. And like I said, the rest is history. It, it's been a blast. It's, it's a challenging industry, but that's what makes it fun. Oh, I believe that. Sure. So let's talk a bit. And, and just as an aside, I actually had the opportunity to visit Warsaw, Indiana last week. I was on a college tour with sons and we're headed from Purdue for, with one of my sons. We we're headed from Purdue to... Uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and I insisted we pull off and visit Warsaw, Indiana, because I've always wanted to check out Zimmer Biomet's headquarters. So now I know where it is. Now I can recognize it when I see the Oh, picture. that's amazing. <laughs> that's right. Was, or it, orthopedic capital of the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was a great trip. But well, let's talk about the spin out. Now, this is kind of an opportune time for you. You've been involved with smaller companies, with sort of startups. Wouldn't call Zim a startup, but it's a, it's a new company. It was a new co for a time called that. What has the experience been like 
talk a bit about when you first became aware of the spin out. Did you know you were immediately going to be involved? I imagine you were since you were part of Spine. And uh, what has been the process? What has the process been like for you? So it's interesting. I, I started with Spine, but about three years ago, I actually took a different role on the orthopedic side of Zimmer Biomet to oh. basically build out and start up their, their ambulatory surgery center business, their ASC business. And so I had moved over to the orthopedic side and was working in a Von Tornos' group, working on this ASC initiative. And when we announced the spin, uh, Vafa Jamali, our CEO, reached out probably a week or two after the spin was announced and said, hey, look, we, we both live in Boulder, Colorado, and know a lot of similar people. And basically, he said, I'd like to talk to you about your background in spine. And so, frankly, it was a combination of knowing we were spinning out the business, as well as, as I got to know Vafa very impressed with his background and track record, and we had a good chemistry there. And so those are the reasons that I came back to Spine to basically take this on. So I had a bit of a hiatus there and then rejoined Spine shortly after the spin was announced. Wow, that's fantastic. So I, I often ask, you know, what were the pros and cons when you make these big decisions? But when someone's asking you to take a role like you're now in, it's kind of hard to say no to that, I would imagine. Yeah, the decision was pretty simple for me because I do love this business, as I mentioned. Yeah. And in many ways, it felt like coming home because I know the surgeons, I, I know our sales force, I know the, the internal team members, the products. And so I felt like I had unfinished business when I when I took this other role a few years ago. And so the, the decision was pretty straightforward. And, and frankly, for me, as I was mentioning, kind of a culmination of my past experiences, this felt like the perfect environment because you're right, it's not a startup, but the chance to kind of form our own destiny and, and really run this thing in a more nimble, fast fashion was extremely appealing to me. That's great. Well, let's talk about uh, about Zimvi's spine portfolio. What is the largest part of your your spine business, your largest group of products? So it's interesting. If, if you think about spine, core spine, which is cervical fusion and lumbar fusion, is still the majority of our portfolio. And mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's the majority of the market. But we have really differentiated ourselves and will continue to do so, especially post-spin, through these motion preservation technologies. So MOBC, cervical disc replacement, that's our single biggest product when you think about how the, the portfolio kind of lays out there and continues to lead the space in cervical disc replacement. And then, of course, we've got our, our tethering technology, which is the first of its kind in the U.S. And right now, we're the only player in the space. And so those are two areas where we kind of set ourselves apart. But the majority of our, of our portfolio is still comprised through core spine fusion. Talk a bit about the tethering product. This is a vertebral body tethering system. It's kind of cool. It looks like you actually have a tether between two vertebrae. That's right. And this honestly is my most favorite element of this business. I think it's by far the most exciting part of our portfolio, not just because of the technology and how, how it works, which I'll talk about here, but more importantly, the patient population that it addresses. And I can tell you that for me personally, as well as many, many team members around the world, it's, it's a true passion project because we have worked tirelessly for years in partnership with thought leading surgeons in the space, with the FDA, um, and countless others to bring this technology to market. So essentially what it does is it's, it's another option for kids who are needing treatment for pediatric scoliosis. And instead of putting a bunch of screws and rods in their back and, and fusing their spine, which is a very invasive surgery and, and also limits mobility, we now offer a non-fusion alternative, which is this, this tethering technique. And you're exactly right. It's, it's simply two screws that are anchored to two parts of, of the spine. And then as the child grows, the curve corrects itself naturally through that growth modulation. So what, what you end up with is preserved mobility, more flexibility, and the procedure recovery time is significantly reduced. And so there's a huge lifestyle benefit to these kids who are able to go on for years without having that rigidity that, that comes as a result of fusion. Hmm. Where does innovation like the innovation that developed a tether product, where is that coming from? Do you have a, a strong R&D uh, shop inside or are you more hungry for uh, technology developed outside of MV? So I would say it's a combination of both, depending on the skill set. Our R&D team has a ton of background and experience in implants. And in fact, the folks that developed the tether team actually came from Lynx. And the reason that we're headquartered here in Colorado is because of the strength of that engineering and R&D team that was acquired through Lynx. And through all these future acquisitions and integrations, we've continued to keep Colorado as, as the headquarters primarily for that competency. Mm. We also, through the LDR acquisition, have an amazing engineering team out of France that's responsible for MOBC development. So both the Tether and MOBC are homegrown organic R&D innovations, which is, is really exciting. And again, there's a lot of pride in the team for, for the technology that they brought to the market. 
Do those two R&D teams, do they cooperate on projects or do they operate primarily as sort of in, within sort of separate silos? They are one team. My R&D leader actually has responsibility for both groups, which is I fantastic see. because we're able to, yeah, kind of glean that, that learning and, and apply it from one group to the other. And uh, are you looking outward for companies to acquire? I'm actually not sure even what the sta- the state of startups is in, in the spine space. It obviously used to be quite huge. Many disappeared. I don't know if there's been sort of a renaissance in this. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I would say that there's certainly still a fair share of these out there. Most are fairly small. Mm-hmm. And we do get approached all the time, as, as do others of our size, to just take a look at different IP or technology. I will tell you that we're very focused on ensuring that we bias our investment and our focus toward these areas of differentiation, which for us are in that motion preservation space. We're also, of course, keeping an eye on enabling technology and want to be sure that we bring the right enabling tech to these procedures to make them even stronger. So those are the areas that we'd be looking externally for the right partnerships, whether it's acquisition or distribution agreements, just to ensure that we're able to to capture some of that technology and innovation that doesn't naturally live within our DNA. We're more implants and hardware. And I think supplementing that technology innovation through some of these outside smaller entities is, is where we would look to, to augment what we have going on internally. And Rebecca, with a tether, does that require special reimbursement? Do you have reimbursement for that? Yeah. So like any new technology as we're bringing it to market, one of the barriers we need to knock down is making sure that insurers deem this medically necessary. And we actually had a big win in July, just last month. Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield has now deemed the tether as medically necessary, which is fantastic because that's a leading indicator for other insurers to follow suit, we believe. And that was done based on the clinical data and the outcomes that we're seeing from this procedure. So we're really excited about what that means for patients. It essentially means that the 30 million plus covered lives that receive Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance will now be able to receive the tether through their, their current carrier without having to go through the denial process and negotiating to have those overturned. So it's a big win for our patients and and our surgeons who are so passionate about delivering this new technology to the kids who need it. That's great. I'd like to understand a bit more about the, I was going to ask you about the enabling technologies. I see you have the universal navigation and the barrage navigation system and the vital navigation system. How are those used? What do they accomplish? So those are really instrument compatibility tools. So what those do is allow our implant systems to be used with navigation systems that are on the market. So it essentially allows surgeons to utilize whatever navigation systems they already have in place with our, our devices. So that's a good first step. But, but when we think about where enabling tech is going next, we are very focused on making sure that, that we find the right technology that is affordable as well as conducive to surgeon workflow. And so what we've been looking at to, to supplement what we already have available through that compatibility is finding that right tech that improves our differentiated proprietary solutions and is extremely relevant in today's environment so that it's not just applicable for the large teaching institutions, for example, but also smaller community hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, and of course, we have a global footprint. So making sure that we don't cost out this technology for places around the world. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of where we're headed when it comes to enabling tech is just trying to be a little thoughtful about making sure we bring the right tech to the right procedure for the right side of care. And, and that's really where we're focused. And how are you looking at opportunities like surgical robotics and image guided treatments? I mean, there are other companies in the, in the spine space are bringing on those sort of larger, more expensive systems to assist surgeons. Is that an area where you need to explore? So we are constantly keeping an eye on that. And I would say that we just don't know enough yet about how robotic is going to evolve in the space. I, I think there's absolutely a role for it, no question. I also think my personal opinion that we're pretty early stage when it comes mm-hmm. to the tech and the outcomes. And so, yes, keeping an eye on it, we believe that there are more effective ways in the short term to bring that technology to a broader a broader group of the market and a, a broader customer base. But um, certainly think that both navigation, image guidance, robotics is we just scratched the surface as an industry and mm-hmm. believe that will continue to evolve. I say this all the time. I think the implants themselves in core spine anyway, for the most part, are they're good. Is there room for improvement? Of course, but nothing revolutionary really jumps out. I think it's going to be this innovation beyond the implant, whether it's predictive analytics, robotics, navigation, that, that's really going to continue to move this industry forward in the face of innovation. Right. And finally, just operationally, I wonder what you've had to do at ZimV, the spine group, to be competitive with with others in the space in terms of ramping up. Were you fully formed? Do you have a fully formed sales staff? 
with the spin out? Have you are you adding people? Will you be adding people? What does it look like uh, in that way? Yeah, it's been a major undertaking. I've been through many acquisitions and integrations, and I can say that separating is immensely more time consuming and uh, challenging than acquiring and integrating companies. And I say that because the unraveling of the DNA, and you just find all these places where I don't think either side fully appreciated just how intertwined we were. That's why it takes a year plus to do the spin successfully. I would say all things considered, it's, it's going very well. But to your point, yes, we've had to staff up quite a bit, especially outside of the U.S., where we had many shared resources in all functions, including commercial. So just ensuring that we've got the right infrastructure, basically, to drive this thing forward has been a major focus for the last year plus. And I would say we're probably 85% through that now. There's still some lingering kind of organizational issues to address, but all part of the plan. And for the most part, that heavy lifting is behind us, which is great because now we can get back to really focusing on where we head next. And do you see any changes to the market? You mentioned your work while you were at Zimmer working with the ASCs. Is spine treatment moving toward a different clinical setting as we're seeing in other specialties? Just give me, if you would, an overview of how spine care is changing, how maybe where it's being performed, what's being done. Yeah, it's a great question. And I absolutely believe that spine is is moving quickly into the surgery center market. Now, certain procedures, of course, will never make sense for the ASC, specifically in the world of deformity and these complex corrections, including tethering. But when you think about something like MOBC, anterior cervical surgery, as well as, as lumbar degenerative surgery, it's, it's the perfect setting for this. And when I was on the, the orthopedic ASC side, what we saw was that spine was essentially mirroring the hip and knee migration. And the reason for that is because as large joints kind of move into the surgery center, those procedures are, are valuable and they're relevant. And these segments of spine that make sense kind of mirror that because the revenue opportunity is there for the ASC owner operators. And it also makes a ton of sense for the patient. I, I like to say this is a, a win-win-win where, where no customer stakeholder suffers. It's better for the patient, it's better for the surgeon, and it's better for the providers and the payers. And so I think that trend will only accelerate. I think COVID certainly gave it a boost. And what we're seeing anyway is that, especially for certain segments of spine, we only expect that to continue to pick up speed. Interesting. Uh, I try to go without talking about COVID, but I am curious, did COVID slow? I imagine it slowed some spine surgery down. They're hardly elective, but they're also not necessarily life-saving. But did we see the slowdown in spine that we saw in other specialties during COVID? Yeah, we did. And, and you just hit the nail on the head. It's not that they're elective, but depending on the severity of the situation, I think it was one of those areas where, where the procedures got pushed. So mm. we definitely saw that in, in 2020. I think for the most part, that's recovered now, but I think it's going to take some time for some of the choppiness in this market to truly sort itself out. And I think that's consistent with what we're seeing in orthopedics and, and kind of other elective surgery spaces. Fantastic. Well, uh, I wish you the best of luck at ZimV. We look forward to following the story. And uh, thank you, Rebecca, for joining us in the podcast. Thanks so much, Tom. Appreciate the time. My pleasure. Well, that is a wrap. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We will have an episode next week. Uh, it'll be a shorter episode, but uh, one with a, uh, a familiar face who will have some news to share. And uh, we'll also be putting out a, uh, a great episode of the Intuitive Talks podcast and another great episode of the Medtronic Talks podcast. Medtronic Talks, you'll be able to find on the Medtronic Talks podcast channel. So make sure you subscribe to that. You can also find it on devicetalks.com. And the Intuitive Talks podcast will be coming out through the Device Talks podcast network. So if you're a subscriber to Device Talks Weekly, you will receive the Intuitive Talks podcast. And again, another uh, abbreviated episode of the Device Talks weekly podcast, but, uh, but one I wanted to squeeze in before our Device Talks West meeting. Finally, please join us at Device Talks West. It would be great to have you there. I'm uh, eager to see people, to shake some hands and to say hello. Just go to devicetalks.com for more information about the agenda and to register to attend Device Talks West, which is happening on October 19th and 20th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. That's it, folks. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. We will talk to you next week. Hey.